Whereas Hispanic Americans have fought in every war since the Revolutionary War, and 60 Hispanic Americans have received Congressional Medal of Honor, our nation's highest military award for valor and action in, against enemy force. And whereas Latinx Colombians comprise a majority of Madison's Hispanic population and work in areas providing essential services, including health care, retail stores, and restaurants, and whereas the same population contributes greatly to Madison by volunteering for their time in churches and local philanthropic organizations. Whereas we appreciate and honor the countless achievements of our Hispanic neighbors and continue our efforts to ensure that Madison is a welcoming and inclusive com community. Now therefore I, Robert H. Conley, Mayor of Borough of Madison, on behalf of the governing body, do hereby proclaim September 15th to October 15th as Hispanic Heritage Month and wholeheartedly support this year's theme. You need, you need, you need us. Inclusivity for a stronger nation. Guillermo. Thank you. Uh, and you know, the whole community, the Latino community of Madison, we would like to say thank you so much for all your support and also for this wonderful activity that we did this weekend when all you help at the community. Uh, Mrs. Trevor, thank you so much for inviting us to be a part of this a uh, grateful moment for us. And our community is growing every day. And also we really like it. We are very happy to be here in Madison. And together, we can just grow out. And in the future, we can be also one of the biggest community, like Italians, Irish community. So <laughs> we like to enjoy it too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Chief DeRosa, Lucas McCoy, please come up. Lucas, your family also. Obviously, with the shirts, we have a great family tradition. It's great to see. But, um, Lucas, it's great to have you as our newest firefighter. Uh, Chief, I would like to have a little, I don't, don't have his bio, we'd like to share a little background on Lucas. Before we the office, right? and now we have... Talk about pressure. <laughs> oh my God. Um, well, Lucas comes to us from Chatham Township. Um, he actually came to us as an uh, intern many, many years ago when he was in high school for, for a couple months when Chatham Township High School is doing an internship. And, uh, but he's been a member of the Chatham Township Fire Department uh, all along. And uh, we've been trying to get him to join and it seemed to work out. And uh, his dad's been in the, as a first responder, was a police officer, retired. And uh, so it's kind of his blood. His brother Tyler, I know, has been a firefighter and is a firefighter. So um, we're happy to have him. And he's a good fit for us. So. And uh, Lucas, we know that uh, this is a bittersweet moment because there is one person missing here, your father, who uh, sadly passed right before you started. And so our thoughts are with you and we're great to, honored to have you on board here. He would be so proud. Left hand in your Bible, raise your right hand. 
Repeat after me. Hi, state your name. Hi, Lucas McCory. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully. That I will faithfully. Impartially. Impartially. And justly perform. And justly perform. All the duties of. All the duties of. Probationary firefighter. Probationary firefighter. According to the best of my ability. According to the best of my ability. I further solemnly swear. I further solemnly swear. I support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And I will bear truth, faith, and allegiance. And that I will bear truth, faith, and allegiance. To the same. To the same. And to the governments. And to the governments. Established in the United States. Established in the United States. In this state. And in this state. Under the authority of the people. Under the authority of the people. So help me God. So help me God. All right, we now go to uh, reports from committees, utilities, Council President Landrigan. Thank you, Mayor. From the Electric Department, they responded to a resident call for two large tree limbs down on the primary lines on Danforth Road and Morris Place. They also responded to, uh, they are currently replacing poles that are in bad condition on Park Avenue, North Street, Ridgedale Avenue, and Walnut Street. They continue to replace the old street lights with LED lights. The electric department installed exhaust fans in the James Park substation buildings. They are working on the Cook Avenue parking lot project with the engineers. The electric department continues to complete daily work orders including new service installations, disconnects, trouble calls, and meeting with contractors to discuss electrical outlights, outlays, materials, specs, and design. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. And public safety, Ms. Byrne. Thank you, Mayor. On August 16th, the Madison Police Department and several borough elected officials hosted the Madison Crossing Guards for annual safety training at the beginning of the school year organization meeting. To date, Madison has over 20 crossing guards to handle an abundance of duties, most importantly, crossing our children safely. Please be cognizant of the guards on duty and drive safely as school is now open and in session. On the 18th, all department member, uh, excuse me, all police department members took part in training at the Madison High School. The officers conducted training on tactical medical care and building clearance training, which included an active shooter mo module. The training was instructed by the Morris County Sheriff's Office and focused on school security and protection of our children and school faculty. Thank you to the Madison Board of Ed and Superintendent Mark Schwartz for the continued partnership. Finally, on Saturday, September 24th, from 11 to 3, <coughs> the Madison Police Department and Madison First Baptist Church will be joining forces again for the second annual Block Party Barbecue. The event will be open to the public and will be housed at Dodge Field, where there will be hot dogs and hamburgers and other light refreshments. There will also be activities for children. We hope to see everyone and continue to strengthen our connection with the Madison community, along with our partners at First Baptist. And then from the fire department, 
During the month of August, the fire department responded to 57 fire incidents and 36 EMS calls for a total of 93 responses for the month. 59 fire prevention inspections were conducted and 30 smoke CO resale inspections were made. Our new fire truck arrived in Madison on August 23rd. The new truck is being outfitted with equipment and training on the new truck will be starting shortly. A spring 2023 wet down is being planned to celebrate her arrival. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I will be at the picnic flipping the burgers. I, uh, yes, thank you. And the community affairs, Mr. Hoover. Thank you, Mayor. The next meeting from the Downtown De Development Commission the next meeting of the Downtown Development Commission will be held on Thursday, September 15th from 7 at 7.15 in the committee room, second floor, Hartley Dyes Memorial Building. Everyone is invited to attend. Uh, the Madison Farmer's Market continues through Thursday, November 17th. The market features a great selection of vendors and live music weekly. Madison's annual fall festival, Bottle Hill Day, takes place on Saturday, October 1st, from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. This year will mark the 47th anniversary of this signature Madison, New Jersey event. This event has continued to grow since it was first established in 1974 by Mayor Elizabeth Baumgartner. With the expansion a few years ago into Kings Road, the, this rain or shine street festivals spans over six blocks and includes sidewalk sales, four stages with live music, three amusement areas, food, and 225 plus vendors, including nonprofits, crafters, retail businesses, etc. For more information on the event, please visit rosenet.org. Two new businesses have opened recently. They are Bagel Nosh in the Madison Chatham Shopping Center and DAO Dao, a new Chinese restaurant located at 258 Main Street. From the Chamber of Commerce, Ladies Night is scheduled for September 15th from 2022 from 5.30 to 8.30 p.m. The first 100 registrants receive a free gift bag filled with items donated by the businesses. The Madison Car Show is scheduled for Saturday, October 1st, in conjunction with Bottle Hill Day. The Chamber is looking for donations of $50 to go towards awards. Please contact Karen Giambra at the Chamber to make your donation. From the Madison Community Arts Center, the next phase of improvement to the physical space will be completed by this coming Tuesday. This includes simple wainscoting around the room perimeter to protect the walls, repairing imperfections in the walls, installing gallery arc hardware that will allow artwork to be hung easily, and repainting to a new color scheme. Photos will be posted to the AMACA website when the work is completed. That's the Madison Arts and Community Arts Center. The center is beginning the, the fall with two play reading series. The New Jersey Women Playwright Seizure Series features well-known women playwriters in the state. The Italian Heritage Play Reading Series will feature plays by three New Jersey women writers on themes that depict the lives of Italian immigrants in a non-stereotypical way. One of the plays, Grace Revisited, is by Dominique Chieri, who has, has family that has, still resides in Madison and de depicts the life of a mother who used to run a restaurant in Morristown. One of the actresses in the play is Andrea Gallo, who was born and grew up in Madison. Maca has received partial funding from Cocha Foundation and the Dante Alchieri Society for the series. The schedule for the readings is posted on the MACA website. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Finance Borough Clerk, Ms. Cohen. Thank you, Mayor. Before I get to my report, I do want to just give um, a brief report on the festival on Saturday, which um, we've received several emails and there's been a couple of posts on Facebook um, from people that have really enjoyed it. Um, on behalf of Madison Chatham Borough and Chatham Township, we want to extend a heartfelt thank you to all of the vendors. Um, the booths representing um, all sorts of diversity, the four food vendors, um, and the performances. It was great to showcase all the different talents um, and diverse groups. We had everything from um, Gamer Gale and his, um, he had a table of Columbian. We had a Central Avenue School Multicultural Club. We had mental health representatives. We had LGBTQ representatives. 
uh, both um, churches in town, the uh, Black, Black, sorry, the Bethel AME Church and First Baptist Church were um, represented, and we got some of the great food from them as well. Um, we had the food vendors, Dow was actually there, um, among some others, and it was a nice coordinated effort by the three towns. Um, it was well attended. We had a steady stream. The weather was really nice, um, and we look forward to building upon it, and um, it's going to become an annual event. A couple of shout-outs to um, Michael Plessier and Lisa Ellis, who were my right and left hand throughout most of this, helping with everything from publicity to organization to um, how to make things work the best. Uh, Lieutenant Duraco, who took the lead for the Madison Police Department, to coordinate um, the officers which were from Madison and Chatham that manned the event that day. And then from DPW, Mike Morano and Louis DeRosa who were with us all day, um, helped from everything from setup to clean up and anything we needed in between, including trying to get um, somebody's music playing that came on a CD, <laughs> um, which unfortunately we weren't successful, but everybody else got to perform. Um, so looking forward um, and more diversity um, events to come and if you're interested in either helping plan or want um, to participate in one or want to come up with your own, please contact me at coend at rosenet.org. And then my report for finance. From administration, I know we just finished this year's budget a few months ago, but administration has already started work on next year's spending plan. The process starts with the various departments, and Ray and Jim have scheduled meetings with all their department heads to discuss the budgets. As mentioned during this year's budget, municipal current fund balances are falling, so budgets and capital will be tight. Uh, once the budget is approved, state law makes it very challenging to increase or modify the budget. One way we can increase the budget is by receiving a grant. Resolution 229-2022 authorizes a change in the budget to permit an increase in revenues and appropriations by $10,000 for a grant the borough applied for and won a grant from the Board of Public Utility for a Clean Energy Community Energy Project. And I would like to thank all the volunteers who helped with the application. Thank you. Thank you. And Public Works and Engineering, Ms. Ehrlich. I want to start over. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Bob Bogle, our borough engineer, reports that there were several water main breaks in July and August, and we'll be hearing a report of the engineering findings related to those water main breaks as one of our agenda items tonight. For the road improvement program, all pavement markings have been completed for the newly resurfaced roadways. That includes Union Hill Road, North and South, Dwyer Street, Lee Ave, Lee Drive, Surrey Lane, Elm Street, Page Street, William Street, sorry, Wilmer Street, Howard Street, and Norman Circle. At the MRC Accessible Trail, the site work company there has requested approval for a change in scope to bring some additional fill to minimize the change in grade between the trail surface and the surrounding site so that a railing is not required. We have that resolution on the agenda tonight for approval. In the central business dis district, there was an emergency sidewalk repair requested by the owner of the Rati building, which is where um, PC Pro sorry, PC Problems is located. This work involved cellar ceiling replacements, sidewalk restoration uh, with the downtown paver blocks and some building support repairs. And uh, Mr. Vogel notes the sidewalk costs were split between the owner and the borough and the building repairs will be paid by the owner. The DPW reports that Public Works and the Water Department have worked hand in hand on these same water main breaks this summer with a number of repairs that came up in July and August. The DPW has finished moving the Board of Health Department to Hartley Dodge Memorial, and they are now working on getting the Civic Center cleaned out. I'd like to note that borough volunteer Jocelyn Colhoun proposed to relocate the flowers, uh, purple cone flowers and oak leaf hydrangea from the Civic Center garden beds to the seating area at Niles Park so that the flower beds would not be um, removed or destroyed in the demolition work there. The DPW assisted with trucks for moving the plants so that Jocelyn and her husband, Steve Tyndall, could save the plants and replant them elsewhere in town. The DPW repainted various school zone crosswalks and parking areas <clears throat> before school started. And as the mayor noted, they rebuilt the horseshoe pits at the Wayne Boulevard Park, uh, which has been a big hit with the area residents there. The DPW met with uh, Mr. Vogel and evaluate, to evaluate all the roofs as they get ready for a uh, future solar installation there. They found a few items that they will work on, such as replacement of shingles and general maintenance to prepare for that future project. 
Um, there will be a fall planting of street trees coming up later this season. And in the coming weeks, they'll be pulling out all of our plows and salters to make sure that equipment is in good working order for the winter. Finally, from the MEC, I'd like to mention that the Environmental Commission's Eco Garden Tour is coming up on Saturday, September 17th. Um, registration is required. You can uh, register for the tour at www.ecogardentour.eventbrite.com. There will be uh, a number of houses and gardens and uh, attractions around town. You can also purchase pollinator plants, learn about great projects that your neighbors are doing. So uh, please be sure to check out the tour and sign up ahead of time. It's a big hit every fall. And the townwide yard sale is October 15th. This is a joint effort between Madison and the Chathams to promote uh, yard sales all over the three towns and get some great turnout. That's all for engineering and public works. Thank you. And health, Mr. Range. Thank you, Mayor. Morris County's COVID-19 community level is high. While Morris County's COVID activity remains high, cases have trended downward since the last peak on July 12th. Within the last couple of weeks, the CDC and FDA have signed off on a new booster vaccine formulation for both Pfizer and Moderna mRNA vaccines. These new bivalent boosters not only provide improved protection for the earlier variants of COVID-19, such as Alpha and Delta, but also the more recent Omicron lineages known as BA4 and BA5. The bivalent boosters replace the prior formulation for boosters for those 18 years and older. Atlantic Health, CVS, Walgreens, the Essex County vaccine site at the Livingston Mall have all begun appointments for these boosters. I've got one for Thursday. Uh, the Madison Health Department will hold uh, booster clinics later this fall. The original two-dose formulation for the mRNA primary series of vaccines remains the approved primary vaccine. On to another public health concern, monkeypox. The number of monkeypox cases in the tri-state area and across the country is declining, but vaccines remain a good way for those at risk to minimize the impact of the monkeypox virus. Monkeypox is primarily passed via close contact with an infected person, especially via skin-to-skin -skin contact. Monkeypox is not known to be air airborne, nor is it considered a sexually transmitted infection. A limited supply of vaccine is being made available by the New Jersey Department of Health through community partners. The vaccine uh, can be obtained uh, at your local health department for those with a known exposure. And for others interested, you can look at the New Jersey uh, Department of Health website uh, for a community partner location in Morris County. That includes uh, Zoo Fall Health in Dover. Moving on, a special note about the location of the health department offices, as alluded to in uh, Councilwoman Ehrlich's report, uh, the health department has moved from the Civic Center, and we're happy to announce that their new office off the rotunda of the first floor of Hartley Dodge Memorial Building uh, is, is, that's where they are now as we make room for that 100% affordable housing project on Walnut Street. All health department services, including nursing, vital statistics, environmental health, are now available in the space previously uh, housing the tax collector. This puts these critical community services under the same roof as many other others that exist in this building. Special thank you uh, to the public for their patience as some services will be limited as we finalize settling into the new space. And a special thank you to Michael Plissier, Mike Fitzpatrick, our health officer, Sarah Paramente, our assistant health officer, and the entire health department staff, as well as the staff at the Department of Public Works, who worked tirelessly before, during, and after the actual move to ensure that smooth tra transition. That's all for tonight, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to communications and petitions. Uh, yes, Mayor, Council, um, Mayor and Council received a few emails, date, uh, one dated August the 23rd from Jeffrey Hankinson of some, from a member of the Summit Line Park Foundation in support of the Morris County Transition Line Pedestrian Trail. Another email dated August the 25th from Daniel Kermans of Pine Avenue regarding airplane traffic and noise over Pine Avenue. And another email dated August the 30th from Neil uh, Stroughton of Kings Road uh, regarding Fred Alaco's paving company. Thank you. And now we're on to our first of two invitations for uh, comment. 
Please note that this one is limited and shortly we will have another one when you may comment on, on any topic. This comment period, you may comment on our discussion item, which is the uh, report on water main breaks and our summer water usage, or you may comment on any of these resolutions, which I will quickly uh, go through. Um, if you want to comment on ordinances, there are none for hear hearing tonight, but uh, you can comment those that for their introduction in the next uh, public comment period. These are the resolutions you may comment on. Uh, 229, as noted in report, was the insertion of an item of revenue for um, this year's budget of $10,000 for a Clean Energy Community Grant. Uh, resolution 230 is awarding professional services contract to Mont McDonald as a site remediation professional, not to exceed $25,000. This is multiple sites in the borough. Uh, Resolution 231 is authorizing contract in the amount of 55,000 to Rosenbauer, Minnesota LLC to repair fire department fire apparatus. Uh, this is being funded through um, ordinance 25, 2022. Ordinance 232 is um, authorizing execution submission of consent forms for uh, permits to the in, in DEP for permits authorizing sanitary sewer main and treatment works approvals for Madison Mall Apartments. It's the, uh, next to the Madison Plaza. Uh, resolution 233 is amending resolution 43, authorizing contract for ultra low sulfur diesel fuel through the Morris County Co-op Pricing Council. No surprise, we need to increase that by $35,000 to 95,000 funded through the budget. Resolution 234 is for the gasoline through the same uh, co-op. Uh, in, increasing by $70,000 to $220,000. Resolution 235 is authorizing use of the Kings Road parking lot by the Madison PBA to host a truck, food truck festival on October 29th. Resolution 236 is um, consent f um, submission of consent forms of DEP for sanitary main and treatment works approvals for 28 Walnut Street and community places. This is our 100% affordable housing project. Uh, resolution 237 is change order from Ballers uh, excavating in the amount of 39,000. Um, this is for accessible trail as noted in uh, Councilwoman Ehrlich's report. Resolution 238 is uh, authorizing a lease of two copiers for the police department through co-op pricing for $446 a month for 60 months. Resolution 239 is authorizing the use of Dodge Field by the First Baptist Church of Madison, as we heard in the report, and that is on Saturday the 24th. Uh, resolution 240, authorizing raffle license applications submitted by the Museum of Early Trades and Crafts. Resolution 241 is a raffle license by Garden Club of Madison. Resolution 242 is execution of a memorandum of understanding with the Township of uh, Chatham for uh, styrofoam recycling. We'll start uh, accepting recycling from the Township residents. We were doing it for the borough already. Resolution 243 is authorizing Mayor's Wellness Campaign to hold this special event on Sunday, October 23rd, and this is uh, with emphasis on mental health. Resolution 244 is authorizing an agreement to renew membership in the Morris County uh, municipal Joint Insurance Fund. Resolution 245 is authorized in the 37th Annual Geralda Farms Run on November 13th. It's a Sunday. Resolution 246 is uh, granting permission for a run for the Chesser home on Saturday the 24th. You can do the run and then go have burgers. Resolution 247 is uh, approving special event permit for uh, Sunday Motor Company to for an event to be held in Kings Road. Uh, September 23rd, 2022, Resolution 248 is ratifying soil moving permit at ta tax spot 2702, lot 24, 14 Lincoln Place. Resolution 249 is ratifying the appointment of Claren Troop and Fatima Janwa as part-time unpaid interns for the farmer's market. Resolution 250 is authorizing contract for municipal manager software Department's uh, SDL, Spatial uh, Data Logic, and this is not to exceed $80,000 annually. And res Resolution 251 is um, for a uh, raffle license for Madison Education Fund. 
And Resolution 252 is rejecting bids for the 222 electric line clearance author um, and authorizing rebid. The uh, lowest bid had to be rejected because of um, errors. And those are all the resolutions. If you caught them all, they may or may not be on the final exam, but you may comment on those or the discussion item. If you want to comment on any of those items, please step forward, state your name, your address, and write the same on the clipboard and try to keep your comments to three minutes, but we'll give you one minute grace. All right, seeing none, I close this part of the meeting and we move on to agenda discussions and a report on our, our summer with water. Bob, our engineer, Bob Vogel. Good evening, Mayor, Council persons. Um, uh, I guess I'm, uh, you all received a memo over the weekend with regards to the water main breaks, and uh, we did that in an effort to try to uh, uh, clarify what number of uh, issues were involved. Um, um, I, I suppose uh, at the outset it's important to state that uh, you know the irrigation demands on our system are always extraordinary during the summer. Uh, so June, July, and August always are big, big water pumping months for our system. And as the system ages and, uh, and uh, uh, things, uh, 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 there's a lot of fluctuation in terms of the, the system pressures and things like that, <coughs> uh, accidents happen. And so we had a lot of accidents this year. And uh, I'm here to try to go over that w with you. And, uh, and uh, we have an emergency appropriations ordinance, as a a Rachel already introduced, on the table for tonight. And um, the public should also know that the state still has a drought restriction in place. Uh, uh, and uh, that has mandatory uh, irrigation limitations within it. So um, uh, without uh, any ado, um, Mike's going to flip up to the first page here. As far as the water main breaks in July and August, uh, Staples Plaza, July 25th, the Del Barton Drive, July 26th, Central Avenue, July 30th, Below Avenue, August 17th, Trail Place, August 18th, Longview Avenue, August 21st. Most of these water main breaks had uh, impacts to our customers, uh, either through low pressure or loss of water for a short period of time. Um, Obviously, it's not something we like to have to deal with. Um, six breaks in, in two months is double what we've experienced in the past. And so it was a bit of a crisis this year. Uh, you know, it's fun from the engineering perspective going back and doing forensics, but it's no fun for the guys out in the trenches trying to uh, fix these water main breaks. And so uh, I'm sure it's all in, in everybody's best interest to do whatever we can to, uh, to limit that in the future. Uh, the good thing about this past weekend is it actually rained, so that was a nice, uh, a nice change yesterday since, uh, you know, July and August had uh, such an uh, incredible drought and a lot of uh, dry lawns uh, throughout town. Uh, Mike, what do you got next? Uh, so the breaks are occurring. Um, there's a number of different possibilities. I believe uh, Operations uh, Superintendent Tom DiBiase feels most likely uh, it is due towards uh, careless use of hydrants throughout the system. And uh, oftentimes that's happening with contractors, whether they be paving contractors or other contractors that need water uh, to uh, mill and overlay roads or do uh, 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 site uh, uh, applications of water uh, to keep dust down. Um, and the like. Um, as we got into it, uh, I will say that some significant changes to the system did happen well before the time that uh, our uh, million paving projects got started in town. So that was a bit of a riddle to me. And I, I know there weren't any breaks at that point in time, but if you look at the system and the system response, there was some really significant changes to our system prior to those contractors being in town. So my suspicion is it's a combination of things, both contractors, pressure fluctuations due to trying to uh, uh, make up water during irrigation. Uh, Tom says all night long the system is pumping, trying to keep up with uh, irrigation demands, and uh, that is a concern. Uh, the last and 
uh, certainly not the least issue in terms of why the breaks are occurring is the age of the system. Uh, we do have large diameter cast iron water mains throughout the system. And um, we've had several decades of replacing water mains of small diameter uh, because the state actually mandated 25 years ago that small diameter cast iron water mains uh, have a high potential for lead uh, at the joints and a high potential for corrosion. Um, and so Madison set out 25 years ago with a main replacement program for those small mains. And we've completed just about all of those at this stage of the game. If there's any left, it's just fragments of water mains that used to exist in town. Um, but now we have the large mains, uh, which are still cast iron, still fairly old, but large diameter mains, and obviously a little bit more expensive to replace. But uh, we ha haven't really set a program in place for replacement of l large diameter mains. We had a program in place for replacement of small diameter mains. So clearly something ought to be put in place moving forward uh, on a planning horizon that uh, some of these large diameter mains get replaced moving forward. Mike, what do you have next? Um, the distribution system map, as you look at the overview of the locations of the various breaks and our facilities, Point out one thing, all the breaks occurred uh, fairly far away from the tank locations and fairly close to our well pump locations. But if you skip up to the next uh, frame, the most interesting part is if you look at the topography map of the borough and uh, up behind me here, you'll see the red contours, which are elevations, are the highest elevations in town, corresponding with something like Woodland Road, which runs the ridge of the town. Uh, they're all highlighted in red. And then you go down to the lower elevations of the town, which correspond to a blue um, contour uh, coloration. You can see that all the breaks that happened happened at the lowest elevations in town. And why that's interesting is the lowest elevations in town have the tallest water column from the top of the tank to the bottom of the break, uh, therefore the highest pressure. And so, um, uh, Pressure seems to be the real uh, culprit here, and uh, older mains uh, are also the culprit. I didn't see any um, joints that blew apart or new pipe that blew apart as a result of these six breaks. They were all older cast iron pipes and central portions of the pipe that actually exploded out the side. Um, and so clearly pressure is the culprit uh, at the lowest elevations in town. And so um, the, that's the reason why. Madison's not alone in this. <laughs> there are lots of towns throughout the state have had similar problems, uh, and I believe nationwide also uh, during droughts. Uh, this is not uncommon for, uh, for uh, systems, particularly older systems, to have to go through an experience. So Mike, what do you have next? Uh, as you look at the SCADA system, uh, the things that stand out in my mind compared to what happened uh, the similar months last year is our pumping was up. So uh, in July, we actually uh, did a lot more pump usage, particularly well C&E. You can see these uh, highlighted on the, uh, on the overview. Um, and if you go to the next frame, you can see tank elevations also um, varied quite dramatically uh, during July and the begin beginning of August. And those tank elevation changes are either due to um, a response to the break, uh, whereas the uh, tanks drain down as a result of that break, and potentially there is something happening before a break. Uh, so if you look at uh, the July 17th timeline here, I think I have a pointer. But if you look at this July 17th vertical bar here, you can see the first activity that's happening in town is well before any paving that occurred, which was starting on the 28th. So what exactly happened here without a break is needs some more research. But clearly, it's not a contractor, in my mind, that's causing that issue. It's something else. And so you know, it's a combination of things, for sure. And, uh, and uh, Tom is not wrong that uh, contractors have to be watched uh, carefully and, uh, and monitored. And if there's ways that we can avoid giving them access to water altogether, that's okay too. 
so we discussed all those in terms of uh, the, the last couple of months when we were experiencing these main breaks. Um, as far as, uh, yeah, our uh, con conclusion here as far as plan of action is concerned, um, immediately uh, pressure sensors. First thing that comes to mind. If you have pressure problems with your pipe, we need more pressure sensors. Uh, so the SCADA system, for some reason, wasn't monitoring pressures uh, down at the plant. And so immediately we went out and got some uh, uh, quotes from uh, PCS, who is our uh, SCADA vendor, and uh, a couple of uh, third-party providers uh, to replace our pressure monitors in the system and get those tied directly into the SCADA system so that not only can we monitor pressures long term, we can also identify to the second when those pressure fluctuations occur. And so if you have a contractor that's operating a valve at a specific time and you know that, um, it's nice to have uh, a SCADA printout that says, okay, this is the time that you did your work and this is the response of our system. Uh, so it really helps nail down uh, abuses of the system in terms of timing. So uh, that's, uh, that was uh, step number one as far as we were concerned. Uh, that's already in progress. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, we had talked about uh, enhanced uh, contractor um, controls. Uh, Tom had sent out uh, one of his staff members, Russ, to monitor the contractors for the balance of July and August um, whenever they were in town, and he believes that uh, uh, had a positive effect, so do I. Um, but initially, when the contractors apparently were in town, there was no monitoring of their use of the hydrants, and so that has to continue through the future, and so that'll be a big help. Um, and then the last thing is, um, you know, really identifying where these uh, cast iron pipes are at the lowest elevations in town thus the highest pressure elevation, the highest, highest pressure uh, areas in town, and trying to uh, pull a program together to replace mains or supplement the mains that are there. And so uh, the, all those things combined, I think, with some SCADA improvements and monitoring improvements um, uh, are part of the reason that ordinance is, is being uh, put up tonight. Most of that ordinance is just in the response for the emergency actions from the staff and from third-party vendors that assisted them out in the field. Um, but we will be using some of that uh, ordinance to, uh, to uh, update the system in response to some of these breaks. So um, uh, last but not, is there anything else, Mike, on, on uh, water usage? Yeah. So I mean, just as far as uh, concluding uh, issues are concerned, um, the state's continues to have a drought emergency watch. Um, I'm certainly available here for anybody that has any questions from the public as far as the ordinance is concerned. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, if we continue to be careful and get a little rain every once in a while, I think uh, September should be a good month for us and October probably be even better as far as emergency responses are concerned. So uh, that's all I have, if you have any questions. Um, you actually hit on something I was gonna talk about or ask about is placing the water mains. And those large cast iron ones, are those the, what I think you refer to as the six to 10 inch? Are those the big ones that you're talking about? Uh, they run six through 12 in town, yeah. yeah. Um, I agree that a plan has, should be put in place to replace, put in place to replace them because even with all these other monitoring systems that you're gonna have, they're still gonna pop. Mm. And will that impact any road reconstruction projects that have or are planned to take place? Uh, not at this point. Uh, I'm not but down the road. I know you've done a lot of work and we've repaved a boatload of roads in this town. Thank God for that. <laughs> but now, will any of these replacement projects mean that we have to dig up some of the roads that we've replaced or possibly postpone? some of the planned ones? Um, uh, probably about 50-50. If you look at what, like the first Staples break that happened out in back of Staples Plaza, that's a connector between Well E, which is through the woods and through uh, uh, some, uh, some grassed areas, uh, off pavement the whole way. 
running down to the DPW and water and light building. So that main certainly wouldn't need any, uh, any pavement uh, uh, replacement at that location. But yes, others would, uh, no question about it. So yeah, uh, it would be good to get a program together and see if we can get working on it. Yeah. The, ex the extremes are, are, are easy to identify, yeah, uh, and hard to manage. Thank you. Uh, De Devin and Eric. Just a couple of questions. Um, with regards to the drought watch, who actually enforces that people aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing or that the adjustments to the irrigation systems have been made? Is that you guys? Is it really kind of nobody and it's the honor system? Were you saying the contractors then? No, 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 just, just in general. There's, there's the, that affects the water pressure. Mm -hmm. If I, and we don't, but if we were to have an irrigation system, I, it sounds like there are rules under the drought emergency watch that we're supposed to follow. Do those get enforced by anybody or is it just a, please follow, we're gonna hope you follow. Well, uh, I know they come from the state and not us, but. You know, uh, jaywalking is a law, so we, we, we can't blame the police for not enforcing all the laws that are on the books, you know. Um, but I think at, at certain times, particularly July and August, we ought to make a, 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 good, a good effort of it and just knock on doors if we need to, if, we, uh, if uh, you see irrigation lines that are, uh, that are on that shouldn't be on. All right, and then with the variable frequency devices, they're not on C and E. Are there plans to put them on C and E? Is that part of what the ordinance tonight is for? Uh, the ordinance that I wouldn't wouldn't cover significant improvements to L C and E, such as like a variable frequency drive or something along those lines, which really gets very pricey um, on the order of a hundred thousand dollars or more individually. Um, so yeah, but uh, some of the pressure monitoring devices that we talked about, they would be there. And are there plans then in maybe next year's budget to try and get those so that there's monitoring on all five wells? Yeah, I think we need to look at that as far as the five-year capital plan is concerned. I think that makes a lot of sense. And then you talked about the oversight of the contractors. That's, so whatever they did for July and August once this all started, they'll continue to monitor to make sure that they're not. You talked about when we talked about the hammering effect where they yeah. don't turn it on right, don't turn it on, something. Well, they it's apologize. more likely when they turn it turn off, off with a knife valve, not necessarily when they're opening it up. So, um, uh, yeah, that's a possibility. I think, you know, uh, managing every contractor that comes through town on every, every occasion is obviously uh, more than current staff can do. But uh, keeping an eye on everybody's use and operation is a key issue to... Uh, uh, minimizing accidents. And then my last question, which may be more question for you, Jim, and so I don't know if it can be answered now, but the new water meters that we're all getting mm -hmm. over the next six months, eight months, will those help prevent some of this from going on potentially because people will be charged different rates? <laughs> the answer is we'd need to have rate change as well, and there is discussion of a uh, potential rate change. We talked about it during the budget process that there are some, uh, we now have within our utility billing system uh, denoting a customer between residential and commercial. It used to be that it was only a two inch customer. A two inch commercial customer, two inch residential customer. There's residential customers on Woodland Road that have two inch meters. Now we've denoted it in our billing system, but still build the same, whether you're a two inch commercial or a two inch um, residential meter. So we have the ability to create a stronger graduated scale to stop that. In terms of monitoring, the equipment that Bob's getting is going to be what really helps in terms of monitoring all these pressure issues that are going on. The, the water modules connected to the meters will not do that. Great. Thank you. Uh, Eric. Thanks, Bob. Um, as I like to say, data is king, so I'm really glad to see that we're deploying technology, even if we've got some antiquated things we're attaching that technology to. Uh, you know, I think that, that can go a long way to help us at least identify and troubleshoot in the future, so I'm glad to see that's happening. Curious on the um, cast iron replacement projects for these larger uh, mains. Do we replace them with cast iron again, or is there a new... Is there a new and better product out there? Isn't there always? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, ductile iron is the, the material of choice, particularly in high pressure situations. They do actually have plastic pipe out there now, which is said to flex better. Um, however, I believe uh, the cast iron is, 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 not, is not even available any longer as, as far as a water uh, main uh, substance is concerned. And ductile iron is uh, the, state, the, the best product that I think we can use. Uh, and I think certainly if you ask Tom DiBias, it's something that he would uh, rely on heavily. Great. And um, just one kind of tangential question. Uh, for the places that were impacted uh, by these emergency repairs, obviously um, living right in front of <laughs> one of them, um, there are still some issues in, in the roads and we did emergency repairs, um, final kind of repairs to bring the roads back to previous state. Uh, what's the timeline on, on that? Uh, in the case of Trail Place, the worst one of the bunch, um, I think we have to repave the entire road. Uh, luckily, it's a very small road. Uh, so probably $30,000 involved in something like that. And then the rest, there's a half a dozen uh, 15 by 50 patches that have to be put in. And I think below uh, woods would be the same uh, as far as that's concerned, uh, unless you have a better uh, solution. I think it's only, it's isolated to one side of the road, as I, as I recall, at below. And so a half, half of the road being repaved uh, around the area that break ought to be enough. Okay, great. Um, and I just want to extend my gratitude to the DBW and the water uh, department guys. They were in the hole on Bellow for, for 12 hours, and then the next day were in the hole on Trail Place for at least that long, if not longer. Um, and they did it more or less with a smile on their face. And Ken O'Brien was out there the Saturday after doing, you know, overseeing the contractors doing the uh, emergency repair. So it was top-notch uh, Madison service uh, through and through, and they were there, I would say, eight minutes after the phone call went into them to, to kill the valve. So um, we're, we're very lucky uh, on that point. And just uh, clarification, and not because I'm smart, but because I have Google in front of me, the, uh, <laughs> the, the drought watch actually does not come with any uh, mandatory restrictions. Only when we get to a drought warning uh, will the state impose uh, mandatory restrictions. So the only thing we got right now is our longstanding voluntary water restrictions, mm. uh, you know, hours and, and that sort of thing. So just to clarify for folks, um, unfortunately, the warning doesn't, or the watch doesn't really do anything. <laughs> Perhaps uh, in a future year, uh, Madison could consider uh, doing its own. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks so much, Bob. Thank you. But Bob, before you go too far, um, the con contracts with the contractors, do we address fire hydrant usage with them uh, in advance, uh, what, what they need to do, or? Uh... Uh, we can certainly, for any municipal contracts, I would think it would be an easy to put uh, special terms and conditions in there, as far as that's concerned. And uh, particularly with the county co-op, um, we had thought about uh, making some recommendations to Randolph, who prepares those co-op contracts, and say, listen, we need uh, an opportunity to recoup some of the damages here. Um, so good chance uh, both of those items, both for our own bid contracts and for the county co-op contracts, can be accommodated contractually in some language that protects us a little bit. Yep. Yeah. There's penalty, and, and um, this might be uh, this above my pay grade, but if there was a request to use fire hydrant, could the wa uh, water department put pressure-reducing valves on the fire hydrant in advance so they're only turning on the lower pressure? It's been a long-standing policy. How, f how closely we monitor that is, is an issue. And, and so, uh, so it yeah. comes down to if they ask, we do it, and we're probably going to be in big shape, good shape. But if they, if they turn it? it on without permission, we're going to be in, we, we, we run the risk. And so that's why we want to have the language in the contract. There's a couple of those little PRVs down at the water department. If anybody asks for them, I don't think they ask very often. So. Yep. Uh, yeah, a little enforcement goes a long way. Sounds good. All Thank right. you. Thank you. And then Jim, you're going to cover the uh, water? Um, I just wanted to touch briefly on what I discussed a few minutes ago, which is, the pot, which is we have now updated the billing software 
to allow us to have um, water rates for residential and water rates for commercial. Uh, six months ago, we couldn't do that. We talked about during the budget cycle um, when I highlighted myself and a few others uh, what their water consumption was like, and it was honestly surprising to see. Some people really use a lot of water. I don't do any irrigation at my house. Um, some people do. So the uh, opportunity, um, once we updated the billing system, um, is now there if we want to do that. So the goal is for administration um, to work with uh, utility and finance liaisons to come up with some concepts and then come back to council um, in the coming weeks with some potential billing. But all, uh, all the other larger water utilities, Southeast Morris Municipal Utility Authority, it's a mouthful to even try to say that, but they have a very serious graduated um, uh, increase in their water scale for uh, residential customers that go over X amount of gallons or cubic feet um, during the billing cycle, and we now can do that. Turn on the microphone, uh, step up to the lectern, state your name and ad address, and um, write the same on the clipboard, and try to keep your comments to three minutes, but we'll give you a one minute grace and stop you at four. Thank you, Mayor. Michael Martinez, Five Independence Court. Uh, I want to uh, start by thanking you for, as a Cuban American, thank you for the, uh, the, the ceremony at the beginning. Um, you concluded your comments, sir. You said a little enforcement goes a long way. It's a perfect segue. Um, at 4.36 a.m. on Friday, September 2nd, my wife and I were suddenly awakened to the beeping of the alarm keypad in our master bedroom indicating an entry door breach. Having followed the news closely and noticing a motion trigger in the driveway, I very quickly realized that intruders, likely armed, were inside my house. Also in the house were our three young daughters, aged nine, six, and three, and our dog. The paralyzing fear, the difficult decisions, and bad thoughts running through my head in those moments are still difficult to fully articulate, and I pray no other family in Madison bears that burden anytime soon. In the end, my family and I were incredibly lucky. Lucky, Madison police arrived in minutes. We later learned the criminals exited the house six seconds after entering because of the alarm beeping. The damage was limited to just our psyche. The extreme violation, picturing criminal thugs lurking in the safe space where our children play, the new nightly paranoia and fear my wife and I have every time a fox or a raccoon goes through that same driveway trigger. Um, it obviously could have been much, much worse. Police Chief Michia stated this could have devolved into a, a life-threatening situation if any of the factors or, or decisions made that morning had been just slightly different. This horrible night has awakened a deep passion and a deep outrage in me, Mr. Mayor. What the heck is going on, and what is our government doing about it? Each layer of the government, federal, state, and local, has an important role. And my view, frankly, is that no one is sufficiently carrying their load. The core of the problem, in my view, is psychology 101. You reward good behavior so it continues, and you punish bad behavior so it stops. These criminals face no meaningful consequences, and they have no fear. Their actions are becoming more brazen, and the risks they're taking in our community are going higher and higher. First they check cars for keys at night, now they're entering occupied homes. What's next? How far will they go? More importantly, where is the action and outrage from our elected leaders? It's only a matter of time before something really awful happens. I'm convinced of that. Trenton and DC had the highest burden. It's obvious that the laws, the legal process, and the books have been wholly inadequate. Bail reform, juvenile sentencing, felonization, police pursuit, catch and release, self-defense in the home. These should all be reworked immediately to address the crisis and protect law-abiding citizens. Locally, Mr. Mayor and Council, you have a different role in two important deliverables as I see it. Number one, you have to speak out. Number two, you have the, you have the resources, to con uh, you control the resources allocated to our police department. On the first point, you have a bully pulpit. You alone, collectively, can speak on behalf of the 17,000 out, outrage and frightened residents from the number one town in New Jersey. Please do it. Speak out. 
be courageous. I would say take it a step further. Lead a coalition of, of like-minded, similarly outraged township mayors uh, in, our, in, our, in our vicinity. Um, well, one minute, Michael. All right. Uh, thanks. Um, Trenton and D.C., they can't ignore this if you guys don't allow them to ignore it. I give major credit to East Hanover, Forum Park, Chatham. They've courageously and consistently been outspoken on this topic. They've held town halls. They've educated the residents on the legal issues on why the front lines have been held back. Um, and they're trying their best to inspire incremental change. Unfortunately, it seems mom has been the word from Madison. Where do you guys stand? Can we count on you? Lastly, sir, on the topic of the police department, Madison Police is fantastic. Uh, they work tirelessly to serve and protect. I now know that firsthand. Uh, but they can't be everywhere at once. I, I ran a quick analysis of East Hanover, Florham Park, the Chathams, Milburn, and, and uh, my numbers showed that they employ 2.8 full-time sworn-in officers for every 1,000 residents. In Madison, it's 1.9. So in other words, Madison employs, has a, has a police department that's 30% smaller on a per capita basis. In closing, I just want to say I don't blame you or anyone. I'm not coming up here to uh, you know, be a flamethrower. Um, I, I, have, I want nothing more than for this town and for you all to be successful, safe, and secure. I do and I will, however, hold you accountable for your leadership and your actions on these points. Um, I think a major course correction is needed, and I'm rooting hard for your success in that. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Michael, and um, thoughts are with you. I appreciate you taking the time, and I know it's not easy for you to share that story and especially to relive that uh, time day after day. Um, you made some very strong points, um, and I've already had conversations with, I have a, a regular group uh, with the Chathams and uh, Mars Township and with the United uh, Front, as you suggested, working with our uh, represent, representatives in Trenton to uh, strengthen things. Um, and obviously there's things that our police department um, does that we do not share to the public that helps protect or helps follow up. Um, and as you noted, our police department's doing a, a great job. So. Um, Yes, we, we got, got your message loud and clear. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to comment? Please step forward. Good evening. Judy Kroll, 27 Laurel Way. Um, I am here on behalf of Friends of the Drew Forest. And, uh, Mayor, you spoke earlier about the hearing that was held on the, I believe it was the 9th, or I forget what day, it was 29th of, 19th of, 19th, 19th of August um, in Morristown. And I just wanted to share with the, the public and also with um, the council and the mayor uh, the gratitude of the friends for all the work that was put into defending this motion. Um, we filed, uh, Friends of Drew Forest filed an amicus brief, Friends of the Court brief, um, in, in support of the forest. We, w we felt it was important for the forest to have a voice at the hearing. And uh, Judge Hansbury accepted the brief, so we submitted that. And it included a 62-page um, environmental report from the Davy Group. So that in conjunction with the actual written brief where we uh, described ourselves, described the forest, described all of the compelling reasons to preserve it, including aquifer recharge, carbon sequestration, water uh, resource and water flood mitigations. Um, and I, what I wanted to thank you for this evening is really just when we put the brief together, it really became apparent to me how much work goes into something like this. There is an awful lot of research. There's writing. There's reviewing. There's re-reviewing. There's making sure you have the right version. Um, and I really wanted to thank you for, and, and uh, I know uh, Ray Cody's not here this evening, but I know he put a lot of work in. I'm sure, Jim, you did as well. It's a tremendous amount of work to put together a brief. And yours was more complicated, of course, than ours was. So I just wanted to thank you all again for your support and to really recognize what went into that effort. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank you and all the friends that um, 
It's always good to have friends in court, but to be there and seeing the uh, friends of Drew Forrest shir shirts in the courtroom with us uh, certainly made it a special. Very good to know that we're all in it together. Hi, following as so, ha so often my good friend Judy, I'm Christine Epburn, One Lightning Bug Hollow Road in Hardwick. Um, it's really nice to see you, Mayor and uh, Council, in person instead of on YouTube. You look much better. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I just, I'm wasting some of my time, but I, I have to say in public that after watching virtually every single Council meeting for the last one year and three months, I have been so impressed with the town of Madison and your part in it. Um, I've always had affection for Ma and respect for Madison. I know you've, I witnessed the affordable housing work that was being done in Madison decades ago. Um, but all that you do in these last year and a half, I mean, the Hidden Figures Project and the Climate Change Action Plan, and I could go on and on, but I don't have time. Um, so Madison is not only a well-run town, but it's a, uh, I, I think a really good, unusually good town in terms of being humane, caring, and environmentally responsible. Um, I drove an hour to get here, and um, I am determined to, to get something off, out of my house. When I was searching my old files, and I don't throw away much for, uh, stuff to, uh, related to the amicus brief, old Drew Forrest stuff, uh, I came across this that, that I would like advice or maybe some, somebody wants it. It's the Madison women's team tennis records from 78. <laughs> uh, this, this, I, was a, I was a team member. I, this was bestowed solemnly upon me by an older tennis player. I think it might have been Margaret Weisberger. Uh, it contains just the records of all from 78 on, you know, Rose Zipper played, and, and Joanne DiBiase, and Ben Brown. And, uh, oh, wow. you got to stay, stay at the microphone there, sorry. Oh, and Anne Delena. Mm -hmm. um, it's a map we gave out to opposing teams with notes of where they could come play against us. Oh, I should say, this is a league that ran from May through early, middle June when the kids got out because it was moms who or grandmoms, um, but moms who could play during the week. It had to, the league had to end before summer. Uh, it was disbanded in the 90s because, lo and behold, the kids were at school, but the moms were um, not available. They were working. Uh, but the map we gave out, interestingly enough, our home courts were the Drew uh, courts. And there's our map. Unless they were, sometimes they were busy, and then we had to play on the absolutely, at that point, horrible courts behind the high school. Uh, does anybody want this? Maybe well, we the can, paper? You can give it to the clerk and we'll, okay, we'll get it. Great. When you get done speaking, when I'm done. All right. uh, share it with Rick. Here, um, I will share this with you via uh, digital photographs, if, if you like, afterwards, you know, tomorrow. This is a letter. No one else has this, as far as I know, um, or admits to it. It's from June 9th. It's um, Drew, to me, Drew University to me, describing their forest restoration project talks about the importance of the forest you gotta love it um, uh, one minute Chris sorry okay oh god oh, I came here to talk about water because you were talking about water um, well, I wanted to uh, talk about how even though we're having a drought now um, as you know climate change will bring us more water in New Jersey an average of 12 inches and more extremely concentrated water events uh, I just want to give it a few things, a few facts. The forest floor, this is from the Penn State Extension research, on average will soak up 18 inches of rainfall before it starts to maybe run off or puddle. Um, that 18 inches or anything, the puddles, of course, works its way down slowly to the aquifer, helping with our water supply. Oh, and by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm not running for anything in Madison, and I would never get elected, but this nighttime irrigation business has to stop. Um, we don't need green lawns. It's inconsistent with sustainable water into the future. You are not getting any more water in your wells. You're getting less. Um, anyway, um, in a study in North Carolina looked at infiltration rates. They went from 12.4 inches of rain per hour in a forest floor down to once that same forest was converted to lawn to 4.4 inches per hour. 
Uh, on that one, forbid. Chris, I have to stop you, sorry. Oh, I came so far. I'll have to come again. All right. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Lenora Clark. I live on Seven Oaks Circle in Madison, New Jersey, and I'm here to comment on the traction line. Um, I had the opportunity to meet several residents that live along Beach Street, Cedar, and Kenny Street. I wanted to get their opinion or their thoughts about having a traction line perhaps behind their house. And I've got to tell you that no one was in favor of it. All right. uh, and for many reasons, um, the impact on the environment. You know, we do talk about the environment and how concerned we are. But the idea of taking down 50 trees seems to be, it's very mind-boggling to me. And it is also to the residents that live there. All right. Um, not only trees, but other native wildlife, also animals, birds. A lot of that would be gone. Once that's gone, it's very, very difficult to replace that. Trees provide a buffer also for noise and are a refuge for birds and other wildlife. They also add privacy to a resident's home and are a positive for a homeowner's property value especially if you live close to or have a train line near your backyard. And lastly, the financial cost of $4 million for a bike path that is less than a mile long. Perhaps for those of you who think this is a good idea, would you still feel that way if this was your home that would be affected? Extending the traction line is not only a luxury we cannot afford, but it will also create more negatives than positives for the residents of Madison. So thank you for letting me know that. Thank you. Uh, any, any future uh, action on the tra traction line, it's all in the hands of the county. Mm -hmm. um, and um, they'll be getting back to us if, there's, if it's moving forward at all. At all. Uh, and all the funding is federal, state, or, and or county. But, um, more, more, to, more to come on that. Who, uh, who makes the final approval about the traction line? C county. Oh, so the council doesn't have much to say about that? Um, yeah, I, I, we try to avoid the back and forth, but just uh, okay. we, we, what they're asking for from Madison is an endorsement, but okay. it, it doesn't uh, necessarily mean that it, they, if they don't get the endorsement that it stops. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> uh, good evening, my name is Matt Van I live at 116 uh, Ridgedale Island in Madison. Um, I just had a comment for tonight. Um, I trust we all want to uh, maintain, if not improve, cost-effective, reliable energy for all Madison residents. I've been talking to Madison residents, and they've been expressed uh, concerns with some of the proposals in the Climate Action Committee presentations. I, too, had some concerns. Um, I'd like to comment on the proposal for the solar panel feasibility study for residents selling their homes and or repairing their roofs. I'm against the pro proposal for three reasons. First, I think it's a necessary cost on the homeowners of Madison. Um, second, if they're going to sell their homes and they need a solar panel study done, it can potentially delay the closing, which is a significant issue for homeowners. Um, third, I think Madison residents are smart enough to determine if they want solar panels on their home or not. I do see solar panels on various homes in Madison. Um, so it's easily accessible information you can go online and look. Um, so I, I think it's a necessary uh, measure. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and the Council. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Um, my name is Jan Ginter. I now live in Ta Chatham Township, but for over 35 years, I lived in Madison, New Jersey. I'm a nurse. I worked at Tufts University Medical Center and had to come home. And I chose Madison to live in, Chateau Thierry and Ridgedale Avenue, a beautiful little house that now looks horrible. But it is what it is. I am now a member of the uh, Madison Thrift Shop. 
and by the way, please, we need volunteers. Can you get it out? Last year we raised, I'm going to use PR, last year, last year we raised like close to $24,000, and we distributed it to like 10 or 12 different agencies under the direction of um, Marcy and Diane. It's a great place. I hope you come in. Um, second is that um, my grandfather worked for Mrs. Dodge directly, and um, so my, hist my family has history in Madison. Um, I met her when I was a little girl. Um, I vaguely remember, but I know I met her. And um, my dad graduated high school in Madison. So I have a long love Madison beyond what you can understand. Sorry, I constantly get sore throats. No COVID. <laughs> um, I'm talking about, I work now in a part-time job, home sweet home on Madison, 27 Main Street. Um, I'm there on Sundays, Tuesdays and Fridays, and extra hours if Janice um, needs me, the owner. I am concerned I've witnessed or been there when there's been two pedestrians hit. One was violently hit and not doing well. The second case, I think, was a hit and run, and they, the policemen, who are wonderful, did get the person. Um, but I think that person's doing OK. But the first person, it's not good news. Head trauma. And you all know what that can lead to. I've also seen people doing K-turns three or four or five times, because I constantly go to the front. I'm always kind of rounding. Um, like I round my patients, the store, and I go out front. They're doing K-turns in the middle of the street. People are jaywalking, and I'm, I'm also guilty, but I think we need more presence of the police that I love. Um, Kevin Boone just retired, I know. He used to always stop and say hello when I worked on, when my house was on Ridgedale. And I, I just love this town so much, and I see a change. I went out to my car the other day. Someone's vomiting right next to my car. That's all I'm going to say. They didn't harm me. They didn't do anything. But I think we need to look at how we holistically move forward with our community, preserve it, yet maintain law and order. Thank you very much. Thank you. And did, did you write your name down on the? Uh... Yeah. Thank you. Can I put someone else's name? <laughs> you can put mine. Okay. Thank you. And uh, just we, we will share your thoughts with um, uh, Chief Misha so uh, he can alert the officers. But just so you know that the recognizing the, the challenge of, uh, we, we pride, as I said earlier, we pride ourselves on having a walkable community. Um, but that doesn't stop crazy drivers and also sometimes doesn't uh, stop uh, bad pedestrians. Um, and so. Yeah. Um, so uh, one of the requests we just sent in to um, the state uh, on, uh, from me uh, with um, Eric Range, uh, Councilman uh, Range's uh, thoughts was to uh, convert the Waverly Place uh, traffic signal so it's a full walk in all directions on, on every cycle, which may encourage big, because Wa Waverly Place, as you know, does not line up. And so that is one of the... Um, bad spots and people don't wait for the walk signs but if we have a full full walk it will uh, be an education of how it works could be helpful but uh, it's a good team effort okay next hi yes my name is Laura Baker I live at 9 Windhurst Drive and um, this was an opportune moment because on August 24th of this past month I was uh, I want to share an experience I had that day at the intersection of Maine and Waverly um, and Central. And I want to make three, kind of post three questions about that intersection specifically, but also make a general comment about traffic safety in town. Um, on August 24th, I was crossing from the Rose City Jewelers side of that street to tons of toys with my two young children, one in a stroller, one and a half year old in a stroller, and my uh, almost five year old on a scooter. Um, and I waited to cross. I looked both ways. I obviously am aware that we have had pedestrians struck in town recently, so I'm on high alert, and my five-year-old keeps me on high alert. <laughs> um, and I knew I could cross. I, we stepped in an intersection, and a car came from Waverly to turn left um, and was coming very fast, a very large vehicle, and I had my hand up for him to stop. It was not clear he was going to stop. 
it was terrifying. Um, so we got across and <laughs> I kind of hugged my kids and was like, okay, that was terrifying. We went in tons of toys, came out to cross the other way. And again, I was obviously on especially high alert because that had just happened. I looked both ways when I got the right to cross. We stepped into the intersection. And sure enough, a car sedan came bounding from central to turn right in toward that intersection. And I was, he came so fast and it was not at all clear he was going to stop. I and other people were screaming by the time he stopped. It was, again, terrifying. Um, so, and, and other people, and, and not only did he become aware that he needed to stop, he then swerved around us to pass. And there were other pedestrians waiting to pass. Um, so it was obviously very dangerous. He did not yield to pedestrians in the crosswalk. So three things I want to say about that intersection and really ask about that intersection. One is um, there is signage that exists, recognizing that we can't immediately address the timing of the, those lights. There is signage that exists that in the state of New Jersey's database of, of traffic signage that can alert drivers to pedestrians crossing in, in places where they aren't necessarily, it's not as clear, Central and Waverly are both quite a distance from that specific crosswalk. So dr drivers who aren't familiar may not recognize that pedestrians will be crossing at the same time as they are turning, um, as, as I think you were just sort of indicating there. Um, and so signage, pedestrians crossing, that exists. We could easily do that. It would not be very expensive. It would be a small step. Um, the second thing is I grew up here, and um, either always or frequently, we were crossed there by an officer, and I thought that was a wonderful practice. It, it, as a young kid, it made a huge impression on me, and I became familiar with the officers. One, one. Sure. Um, finally, I, that's something I would love to see again, especially with more congestion in town than there was 30 years ago. Um, third on that intersection, the timing of the light. It is so critical that there is an opportunity for pedestrians to cross when no traffic is passing or approaching that intersection. Um, and I think we really need to take into account the 10 and 12 year olds who are in town who may not have the awareness or judgment to know that there might be cars coming or the older person who may not have the mental acuity um, to recognize that as well. Um, finally, my public comment about traffic safety in general is just um, that I think people don't always understand, drivers don't always understand that pedestrian crossing signage means they're required by law to stop. I think many of them see it as a suggestion. And you know, one woman on Facebook specifically said, when I point it out to people, they often either speed by me or give me the finger. And I think that just doesn't represent the best of what Madison's got going on. So I do think a public um, awareness campaign around traffic safety in town is something worth considering. Thank you so much for your time and, and all your hard work. Thank you, and uh, certainly good uh, timing. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, just a, a, a couple of um, follow-up on that. We, we did... Um, I ran a campaign working with Trans Options, which is now uh, avenues in motion as far as uh, awareness, uh, and there were some shown some improvements. So it shows that education is uh, very important. The, um, as you know, our engineer is uh, here tonight, and he's sitting two rows behind you. I saw him taking notes, and so we will uh, be working on that as far as the additional signage. Um, one of my pet peeves in the state of New Jersey is the fact that. No turn on red. There's no consistency as to where the sign is. And if you know, if, if you're sitting at Central Avenue and you're the you're at the stop bar, you don't see the no turn on red sign anymore. So I've requested that that be put up right next to traffic light because that's where you should be looking. Um, and I, the we we also recognize that the Central Avenue and Waverly are misaligned um, intersection. It would never be designed that way. We are in the process of uh, planning on the reconstruction of Waverly Place. Whether we can address that or not, we don't know, but it's on the table because it's obviously an issue and maybe we can make for greater improvements by uh, addressing. So thank you for your sharing your thoughts. Uh -huh. Richard Zipper, 197 Greenwood. We heard the name Rose Zipper earlier tonight. <clears throat> uh, yeah, she really enjoyed the US Open uh, on ESPN over the past two weeks. 
at, a, made a, at 102? Made a point of uh, going there and, and turning it on for her and watching it with her. Because uh, if I just told her it was on, she would forget. So um, I'm speaking in favor of extending the traction line closer to downtown. Um, this, this type of thing is being built in communities all over the country. Um, New Jersey really lags behind because, um, you know, we're built up a lot and it's, it's hard to fit these things in. Um, there were two objections to it that I read about in the, in the um, newspaper. One was the uh, amount of trees being cut down and the other was the cost. Um, I think that, um, and I thought about this 10 years ago when they first brought it up, I want to thank the Morris County Park Commission for re-inviting re this. Um, but uh, going all the way to Elm Street seems very impractical to me because the, the traction line, it gets very narrow at that point. It, it narrows down. And at Elm Street, I don't even see any room. I mean, it would have to be, uh, you'd be looking right in the people's back windows and they would have to build a very substantial retaining wall there. Uh, which would add to the cost a lot. I believe if it ended at um, West Street or Kinney Park, that would be the most logical place to terminate it. Um, the other uh, thing is it seems like they, they want to build a 10-foot wide trail. And the, it, what looks good on paper sometimes always doesn't look good when you've got your boots on the ground. And um, I think they're taking a bulldozer approach to building this trail where they should be taking a, um, a ditch witch approach. In other words, uh, maybe have the trail meander around a little bit, uh, maybe narrow in certain points to save the roots of the trees because the trees do provide shade in the summer and they block the wind in the winter. So they're, they're, it's nice to have trees along a trail. It enhances the trail. Um, I think that these modifications would still achieve the goal of the trail, and that goal is connectivity. Um, it would be connect one portion of town to another portion of town uh, with an off-the-road uh, experience. And uh, having it come in to Park Avenue on West Street or from Kinney Park um, would still get you down to the part of Park Avenue where the traffic is slowed considerably. Um, uh, I, I really don't see the difference between there and Elm Street. In fact, Elm Street is a hill. Cars come zooming down the hill, and there's a bridge there which blocks the, uh, the sight line. So uh, it, it may even be a safer option, in my opinion. Thank you. Richard. Share your comments with the county. Be helpful. Anyone else wishing to be heard? Alan. Suzanne. Hi, Suzanne Schreiber, and I'm at 106 Greenwich Court. Um, my comments are also on the traction line. Uh, I believe when Denise was here, uh, Chaplick, she um, spoke of the project being 3.3 to 4 million dollars, and roughly 50% of the cost being the removal of the trees. And she said that these funds were very competitive, that the project was about 50% funded by federal money, and that the balance would come from local sources like MCPC and Morris County. Um, I just wonder what other projects might be forfeited in order for this project to go forward. And you know, we're, we're desperately looking to fund the forest. Maybe that's a better use of the three to four million dollars. Um, and there is irony in the fact that we're trying to save a forest and cutting down four, 40 to 50 mature trees. So um, I know she's coming back, making a presentation. I don't know if we have that date yet, but it would be helpful because um, I think there's a lot to consider here and maybe there are other alternatives to be considered. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. And I, I know some of the additional work that um, the county was going to do before coming back was doing a, an actual tree inventory to get a full feel for it. 
And we're also going to be uh, holding a uh, joint meeting with some of the of our environmental commissioners, Shade Tree and others. So um, at this point, I've not heard on a follow-up. Um, and as far as, uh, you know, what, what other projects could be done, that, again, would be a question for the county since it would be, it's county funds. Alan, welcome. My name is Alan Spital. I live at Six Rose Avenue. I'm here tonight to read a statement by resident Amy Chase, 43 Niles Ave. Amy couldn't be here, she's out of town, but she thought it was important to have the statement read, so I'm reading it for her. At the last council meeting, council member Rachel Ehrlich celebrated passage of Joe Biden's Federal Inflation Reduction Act, which ought to more honestly be called the Inflation Maximization Act. Ms. Ehrlich said it will invest billions in deploying zero emission technologies to reduce greenhouse gas pollution and mitigate the worst impacts of climate change. The next morning, the Wall Street Journal published a United Nations model estimate of the impact of these very provisions, stating by that the year 2100 will reduce the estimated global temperature rise at the end of the century by, wait, 0 to 8 degrees Fahrenheit in the optimistic case. In the pessimistic case, it's 0 0.0009 Fahrenheit. In other words, the article states the climate provision in this valued legislation will have no notable impact on climate. Among the reasons why, China, India, Africa aren't about to stop burning fossil fuels as they develop. This does not engender confidence in Madison's Climate Action Committee. Reducing greenhouse gas pollution and mitigating the worst impacts of climate change are Ms. Ehrlich's stated justifications for her plans. Obviously, and she says in her own words, she's a climate activist. Her plans are invasive to private and business property, risky to reliable and safe energy infrastructure, expensive to taxpayers and all consumers, ugly as solar and wind farms occupy our landscapes, and they will not bear the promised fruit. Factually based arguments abound to the impossibility of even implementing these pro-electricity plans, let alone the impotency of their effect and the harm they will cause, harm they are currently causing around the country as other Democrat-controlled communities foolishly experiment on their population. We respectfully request that the Council energetically pursue these alternative arguments so that in the matter of climate action, we don't follow a Pied Piper over the cliff. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, and uh, we all have to keep in mind that if no action is ever taken, whether it China and India join, we are all doomed. But uh, thank you for sharing your thoughts. Anyone else wishing to share comments? Seeing none, I close this part of the meeting, and we now move on to interaction ordinances. Will the clerk please read the statement? Ordinance is scheduled for first reading. Have a hearing date set for September the 26th, 2022. All will be published in the Madison Eagle, posted on the bulletin board, and made available to members of the public requesting copies. I call up ordinances for first reading and ask the clerk to read said ordinance by title. Ordinance 43-2022. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison appropriating $20,000 from the General Capital Improvement Fund for the purchase of portable, portable trailer mounted message sign. Mayor, I move ordinance 43-2022. Mayor, I second the ordinance. And uh, for information, these are affectionately known as stalker boards also, they, um, the messages that the police department uses, but also monitor speed and uh, record and other things. Any further discussion? Roll call vote, please. Ms. Byrne? Yes. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Ehrlich? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mr. Range? Yes. And Ordinance 44-2022. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison appropriating $150,000 from the Water Capital Improvement Fund for Utility Emergency Responses. Mayor, I move Ordinance 44-2022. Mayor, I'll second the ordinance. And we've already discussed this. This is uh, taking care of our issues we've had this summer. Any further discussion? Roll call vote, please. Ms. Byrne? Yes. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Ehrlich? Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mr. Range? Yes. 
We move on to consent agenda resolutions. Will the clerk please read the statement? Consent agenda resolutions will be enacted with a single motion. Any resolution requiring expenditure is supported by a certification of availability of funds. Any resolution requiring discussion will be removed from the consent agenda. All resolutions will be reflected in full in the minutes. Mayor, I move resolution 229-2022 to resolution 245-2022. Yeah, but don't we have 252? You're missing the next page. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's, it's, what happens when we miss the August, second August meeting? Uh, sorry, it's a, it's a resolution 252-2022. The second. Any uh, discussion or any that need to be pulled? Roll call vote, please. Ms. Byrne? Yes. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Cohn? Yes. Ms. Ehrlich? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mr. Range? Yes. Approval of vouchers will be, uh, or there is no unfinished business. Uh, and now, so we move on to approval of vouchers. Clerk, please, please read the totals. Yes, for the current fund, $4,328,078.62. From the general capital fund, $492,494.67. The electric operating fund, $815,391.36. From the electric capital fund, $10,318.37. From the water operating fund, $43,295.76. And from the trust, $323,221.19. The total is $6,012,799.97. Motion to approve. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All, I mean, uh, roll call vote, please. Ms. Byrne? Yes. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Ehrlich? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mr. Range? Yes. Under new business, I'd like to make the following reappointment and requesting council confirmation. This is for the Mass Housing Authority Board, uh, Jeff Smith, 26 Green Hill Road, um, for a five year term, August 10, 2027. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Here, I move we adjourn the meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming to join us tonight. We did take it.